on the tables of the eighth and the ninth. The tables of the eighth and the ninth tell us many things about the physical construction of our universe on a purely mathematical level. The level which serves as the bridge between the external formation of the material world and our relatively internal domain of consciousness. My arrangement of these tables therefore allows for the application of numerology or the realization of relationships between the digits and SWE or in themselves. This existentialist approach to computation is as ancient as the human practice of collecting objects in countable sets and constitutes an esoteric equivalency to the exoteric fact of pure traditional mathematics. Regardless of the excuse of its origins, this practice's credentials are frowned upon in the light of pure mathematics as an escape from the understanding provided by methodological calculation. They are, quite to the contrary, no more than a reapplication of methodological computation on an entirely other level, self-contained and non-threatening to the approach of exoteric mathematica. Thus, while their examination may be seen as untraditional, it is at least not unacceptable. One of the fundamental insights of the tables is provided by comparison between the two. Their primary similarity is the repetition of pattern, their primary difference being the nature of these patterns. As the eighth demonstrates quantifiable decline in sequence, so the ninth yields first exact self-replication and then increasing self-referential sequentialism. These patterns are apparent and undeniable. If the calculations are repeated in any other setting, the conclusions will be exactly the same, and therefore the patterns displayed in their relationships will be identical. Numbers do not lie. They lack that motivation for symmetry. It is possible to see these sequences of both as related to one another dimensionally. The perpetual numerological decline of the eighth and the perpetual numerological duplication and factorial increase of the ninth may be seen as ascent through the first three dimensions respectively. The diminishing table of eights constitutes collapse into a singular point in space. Naturally, one can question how there can be any differentiation at all in the measurement of a point, but the answer is a simple one indeed, for without it there would be no scale correspondent maps. The repetitive aspect in the nines resembles the extension of a line in space, at all points along the line, two of its dimensions are cancelled, leaving only the third behind to mark its position. This is quite obvious in the graphing of a straight vertical or horizontal line in a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system, where either the x or the y coordinate pairing remains undefined. It may be less obvious in a diagonal, where every point on the line has a defined x and y coordinate pair, that differs from every other coordinate pairing of a point along the line. However, the distance formula shows that any two points on a graphed straight diagonal will cancel one another out, leaving only one integer behind, that being the value of the line itself. This may seem trivial now, but it is essential for understanding the next comparison of the ninth table to dimensionality. One need only to consider that a line in a two-dimensional coordinate system, straight or diagonal, is equivalent to a plane in a three-dimensional coordinate system to begin to apprehend why. 
Although it is a confirmable fact that the integer sums of the multiplicative quantities produce a doubling of results along factorially related lines throughout the entire ninth table. This only becomes really evident after the process has entered its third repetition, when the quantities involved are of such an amount that their sums render divergent factors. What this process is in fact describing is the event of entrance into the third dimension from the second. At first, as the plane is defined as two lines of value 9, the factorial sums elevate rapidly through the established sequence. As the shape becomes clearer while the coordinate system is rotating, the number of quantities between the factorial transitions becomes greater, allowing, as it were, more time to pass between phase shifts. The key to understanding the shape that is described is contained within the non-numerological pattern of Table 9. The factorials diverge first after product 180. That is, their sums, if taken by pure integer alone or by combined integer, render different results, although both results that occur elsewhere as quantities within the initial multiplicative table. At quantity 108, the products break from the ascending sequence and linger at sum 18, or, if they are taken as a pair of paired integers, begin to decrease along the same factorial lines, beginning at 63, but skipping every other factor, such that the next result yielded is 45, rather than 54, etc. This is the case until 180 appears again as the multiplicative function. The result for 198, that immediately following 180, is peculiar, as it constitutes a different rate of change than has been previously established. Although it describes the results for all the quantities of multiplication between 181 and 240, interrupted only by 200, times 9 equals 1800. This still describes a much shorter set of numbers than are contained within the 36 factorial grouping from 241 to 390 which follows 58 as opposed to 148 respectively. This anomaly also helps to point out that the phase shifts in sums don't occur cleanly at factorially defined breaks but are governed only by the dictates of the digits themselves. Although this opens up the realization of still another, more subtle pattern, the difference between the clean factorial 243 and the true break of 240 for the 27 factorial set being 3, and the difference between the clean factorial 396 and the true break of 390 for the 36 factorial set being 6, it is unnecessary at this point to go into it in detail. It is more instructional from a dimensional emergence perspective to examine the factorial breaks that are clean, and those are 180 and 360. These numbers are most immediately recognizable as the definitions of the circumference in degrees of a half circle, the angle measure of a straight line, and a full circle or, if you like, the angle measure of a straight line that reverses its own direction. But they have more, deeper connotations than this. The most fundamental polygons are the triangle, the square, and the pentagon, composed of three, four, and five angles, respectively. The hexagon, with six interior angles, is somewhat more complex and can actually be tallied to be the sum of two triangles. The sum of the angles of a triangle is 180. It is always exactly and only 180. The sum of the angles of a square is always 360. 
90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 90. This is true for any four-sided rhombus, according to the formula that n minus 2 times 180 equals the sum of the interior angles for any object with n number of sides. Applying this same formula, we can conclude that the sum of the angles of a pentagon is 540, or 3 times 180, or 1 and a half times around the circumference of the unit circle. These numbers are as old as the act of measurement itself, and they are absolute. So we can see how the clean factorial breaks in the ninth table pertain not only to angles that describe arcs, but to those describing well-defined shapes, particularly the fundamental polygons, as well. Moreover, these fundamental polygons comprise the sides of the only five regular solid polygons that can exist in three dimensions. All other solid polygons, like the hexagon in two dimensions, are only combinations of these first five. The platonic solids consist of the tetrahedron, comprised of triangles, the cube, composed of squares, the dodecahedron, comprised also of triangles, the isosahedron, also composed of triangles, and the dodecahedron, comprised of pentagons. So we have not only the description of angle measures on the unit circle, but also the sums of the angles of the faces on each of the five platonic solids, and all in a pure numerical form. It is easy to follow the progression of factorial breaks up through their ascending sequence and see how the sums constitute measures within a deepening three-dimensional space, describing the unfolding of the platonic solids according to the sums of the interior angle measures of their faces multiplied by their facial sum. It would be more probable, at this point, for a practitioner of calculatory mathematica to caution that the bad habits of a writer may be transferred to their readers, then it would be that they could provide hard evidence that this data is more conjecture than implicit organization. In either event, it cannot be doubted that the dimensional bridge between function and form is crossed in the table of nines. The bridge described herein is not altogether complicated but is increasingly complex as more governing rules are discovered to determine each additional dimension. For example, the point may be seen as of any size under magnification. The line is definitive of angle and implying the edge of a perfectly flat plane. Three-dimensional objects are formed simultaneously of matter and energy comprised not only of charged particles, but of waves with measurable frequency related to this charge. This relativity of fundamental components and distance becomes substantial in the fourth dimension, the final to be considered here, where an object has form in both space and time, according to the measurement of intervals. All of these are descriptive of the same process differing only in the complexity of dimension. To understand the relationship between the table of the nines and the fourth dimension, it is necessary to lay a minimal foundation. Some formulae and models describing progression should be given, as it is by progression that time is measured. It is this process that has thus far been described, and which constitutes our bridge. Growth in biological organisms is measurable according to an exponential law for equal angular spirals that gradually approach ratio-based orientation. 
An example of this is that governing the formation of a nautilus shell, given as R equals AE to the power of kappa theta, where R is the radius of curvature, A the area, E the natural number, 2.71, found in exponential balances, K the kinetic energy, and theta the polar angle of predicted curve continuation. Although it seems completely unfamiliar, this formula has been underlying our progress all along. It describes the function of the ninth table, whereby the lower dimensions are evoked rapidly and the forms of the higher dimensions more slowly. What this formula means is that the spiral of the nautilus shell is curled more tightly around its origin, rapidly forming a circularly bound core. As it continues, the arc of the shell expands to break its circular condition and rate of growth slows. This is the same exact process as described in the numbers of the ninth table. Now, what does the similarity have to do with the fourth spatial dimension? If the rate of growth of either a nautilus shell or the ninth table's factorial breaks were plotted as a sine wave, it would have high initial frequency and minimal oscillation followed by lower gradual frequency and more pronounced oscillation. This chart describes the unfoldment of progression for either equally well. It is itself also a three-dimensional shape. If it were plotted in a three-coordinate system, the sine wave would orbit around the x-axis, alternating positive and negative in the y-axis with an expanding radius in the z-axis. If it were displayed with its complement as well, numerically negative products of all the multiplicatives or geometrically the cosine wave, it would take the familiar form of the double helix of DNA. Before we go into the implications of the gnomon, described in the ninth table, let us first pause briefly and consider the construction of a sinusoidal wave. In trigonometry, the study of triangles, lies the basis of wave measurement. A wavelength, lambda, may be measured as two right angles extending up to the endpoints from the baseline of the standing wave, sharing either a common point where the waveform crosses the baseline, or the vertical leg, where the waveform reaches its peak or trough. These triangles are equivalent for a sine wave depicting circularly bounded progression and isosceles, possessing two equal length legs apiece. The method of creating the sine wave itself comes from a technique for deriving a right triangle's non-right angle measurements from the measures of its legs and hypotenuse. The sine function for an angle is the opposite leg over the hypotenuse, the cosine function for the same angle being the adjacent leg divided by the hypotenuse. These two functions, as it was stated before, are complementary. This is expressed in the relationships between sine and cosine for a triangle ABC whose right angle is C. Sine A equals cosine B and cosine A equals sine B. When the numerical solutions of these functions are graphed, a sine wave appears which is a spiral in three dimensions. As a measurement of interval, this is also a fourth dimensional shape. Now we may consider the progress through dimensions of the described spiral 
as it breaks from circular boundary conditions and what form it takes after it does so. The first point that should be made is the distinction between degrees and radians. Both are measurements of the arc of a circle or the radial expansion of a spiral bound by circular or exponential conditions, but the former is fixed and the latter is open. Radians, unlike degrees, are dependent upon the transcendental measurement of pi, an irrational integer whose value is roughly 22 divided by 7, or 3.1415926. Pi, based on the Greek letter pi, is an expression for the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. The relationship between degrees and radians is such that each pi radian equals 180 degrees. It is interesting to note that a spiral column of tetrahedrons, such as Buckminster Fuller modeled for the geometry of a double helix, undergoes one-third full rotation while 22 of its faces are exposed. Thus, pi is the limiting factor for the spiral in its early stages of progression as it crosses the threshold of the first two dimensions. As it enters into the third, the forms it describes become exponentially complex, and the time interval elapsed between factorial breaks therefore begins to widen. The limiting factor remains a transcendental number, an irrational integer similar to pi, but one that describes an open set for growth along dimensional lines. This integer is phi, Greek letter phi, and will be shown to occur in pure mathematics, quantum mechanics, and the heliacal pattern of DNA. It is this number that governs the third dimensional forms derived from the ninth table, as well as the fourth dimensional pattern of their progress. In order to decant phi from the table of nines, we need only convert the products given to degree measurements, a process already implied by the clean factorial breaks occurring at the 180 and 360 multiplicatives. Once this is done, a chart for the sine and cosine functions of these angles may be assembled, and using larger later occurring sums for these, phi will be revealed. The 2 sine squared and 2 cosine squared sums are preferred and yield results containing both phi and phi prime, expressed as phi to the power of 1, that is, the reciprocal of phi, or phi over 1. Some of the most notable results of this table are for 9 degrees, or pi over 20 radians, 2 minus the square root phi plus 2, 2 plus the square root phi plus 2, sine and cosine functions respectively, for 18 degrees, pi over 10, phi to the first plus 1, phi plus 2, for 45 degrees, pi over 4, phi plus phi reciprocal for both, for 72, 2 pi over 5, phi plus 2, phi reciprocal plus 1, and for 81 degrees, 9 pi over 20, 2 plus the square root of 5 plus 2, 
2 minus the square root of 5 plus 2. The complementarity of the sine and cosine functions is readily apparent here. These figures represent distance relationships between points on what is called the golden triangle of 36 degrees by 72 degrees by 72 degrees after phi which is itself the golden ratio of 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 with approximated value of 1.61803. Some other properties of note possessed by phi are that multiplied by its reciprocal, the value of which is negative 0 0.61803. Its product is negative 1 and that squared it is equal to itself plus one. The spiral described by phi is thus the so-called golden spiral and is exponentially bounded rather than circularly its points being phi, phi squared, phi cubed, phi to the fourth, phi to the fifth, and so on. These constitute the bridging of dimensional gaps described by the tables of eights and nines, and the slower, more numerous, three-dimensional forms that arise by angle sum recurrence during the later stages. It is interesting to note that a line connecting two points on opposite sides of a third point in a pentagon forms a line that, intersected by another such line drawn from the third point, forms the golden division. Thus, not only is phi determinant of the rate of third and fourth dimensional progression, but a fundamental building block in the platonic forms themselves. Before going further, a brief clarification between the circularly bound and phi bound spirals should be considered. In the circularly bound spiral, the juncture points of the sine and cosine waves do not necessarily occur at the baseline of the standing waveform, nor are both their apex and nadir points compatible with opposing peaks and troughs. Because the oscillations are so small, however, this factor is compensated somewhat so that they may appear so. In the phi-bound spiral, the conditions are more like the traditional depictions for DNA if the exponential function is doubled. It is at the third repetitive juncture that the circular becomes phi. We have seen how phi affects the factorial breaks in the numerical sums of the products of the ninth table, resulting in first a rapid expansion through pi limited dimensions, and later in gradual progression through forms in an open dimension that are themselves the results of its interactions in that dimension. The hypothesis that, as a measure of interval, the phi over pi spiral itself is a governing factor of a still higher dimension has also been forwarded. Next, let us consider the applications of this revealed pattern of forms in the real sciences of math, physics, and biology. It has already been stated that the pi or circularly bound spiral in its initial stages of formation yields markedly different results than the phi binding does later. This difference is the gap between the second and third dimensions bridged by its progression. The pi constraint 
means that the spiral's growth is arithmetic and that only the sine and cosine waves can be plotted to measure its factorial breaks. The larger numbers of the later products in the ninth table, allowing for as many as three different simultaneous solutions for a single product's digital value, all representing products already given earlier in the table, are governed by exponential expansion, where only phi and its reciprocal complement phi prime determine the location, or rather the moment, of each factorial. The difference in a chart plotted for these two different types of growth is the difference between a horizontal line and a diagonal, respectively. Another, more statistically appropriate depiction of exponential growth is the asymptote, an upward curve approaching infinity. These averages for the variance in the spiral may be taken to represent its standing wave state, or the baseline between itself and its complement. The most significant distinction between the arithmetic progression of the second dimension and the exponential progression of the third dimension is the graph of the relative locations of the factorial breaks occurring at the complementary juncture points. The juncture points of arithmetic and exponentially bound spirals differ, as has already been demonstrated by the distinction between the sine and cosine waveforms and the phi and phi prime waveforms. In the later system, they will always occur at the event of intersection with the baseline given for the underlying growth pattern. This would seem to have little relevance as the spiral is three-dimensional and thus has no real juncture points between either sine and cosine waves or phi and phi prime waves, both merely arcing around each other along the baseline x-axis. But these points are where the factorial breaks occur and have relevance in the fields of quantum mechanics and biology. In quantum mechanics, particles are so small that there is no way to observe them without disturbing their behavior by doing so. For example, sending a photon into the probability field of an electron cloud changes the path of the electron to be measured. Thus, either position or velocity for a particle can be measured at one time, and this is what is known as the uncertainty principle. What is really implied here is a change in probability itself. The probability of the electron in the example following its given course before being struck by the photon is a certainty. The probability of it following the same course after being struck by the photon is an impossibility. The inverse of these statements is also true. In the context of Table 9, this translates to the clean factorial breaks occurring at the phi and phi prime intersections, and the rest of the factorial breaks occurring at the sine and cosine intersections, or at later points along the opposing peaks and troughs determined by phi. In the practice of constructing histories, the positions of a particle over a period of time are considered. The spiral may be thought of as a graphic depiction of a history. Quantum mechanically, the numerical factorial breaks constitute positions where probability undergoes inversion. Three terms govern the behavior of the particle at these positions. R, radius, theta, the polar angle, and phi, the azimuthal angle. R allows the emission of a photon, releasing energy, or one's absorption. Theta measures precession, and phi is the spiral path taken between orbital energy shells, whereby the electron will lose energy approaching the nucleus, or gain energy retreating it. We can easily observe the same pattern being repeated on a larger scale in astronomy. 
The most obvious would be a plotting of the movement of the heavenly bodies about their elliptical orbits over a period or duration, such that the spiral may be viewed as their positions over time, similar to the history constructed for the position of an electron. An even closer examination of the interaction and structures of the fields that cause this yields an even more detailed discovery as to Phi's presence. The solid-state planets, those within the asteroid barrier of our solar system, just to name a few, obviously obey only the pi binding for their formation. The result is that they are centered approximations of spheres, whose phi, or gravitational force-breaking, traits are limited as much as possible, resulting in the equatorial bulge, for example, and by interaction with our moon, a pi cyclical timetable of the tides. The atmosphere and electromagnetic forces surrounding these solid state planets are a somewhat different matter, but this is best explained by looking at the planets that are themselves more entirely governed by these forces respectively. The gas giants, therefore, represent the point at which the pi internally oriented and phi externally oriented spirals most actively interchange. Their atmospheres manifest violent and extremely mobile centers of opposing pressure, creating immense ionized, semi-acidic storms. The most notable of these is the red spot on the surface of Jupiter which has been modeled on a computer using supersymmetric statistical averaging. Saturn represents the most pi bound, with its ejected rings of neatly circularly situated frozen materials, and Pluto the most phi bound, with its erratic solar orbit and its nearly horizontal rotational axis. For both of these planets, it is the electromagnetic field that is the suspension where the spiral's transformation plays itself out with such astonishing effects. The best location for an observation of the spiraling nature of this field is the Sun, directly at the center of our system, whose atmosphere is entirely dependent upon the mathematical structuring of its behavior. While it is Jupiter's atmosphere that is the most clearly at the cusp of the spiral's third permutation atmospherically, the Sun is already there entirely electromagnetically. In short, what occurs on Jupiter within its atmosphere is nearly mathematically identical to what is occurring in the outer corona of the Sun. The only significant difference is between the pi-bound temporal pattern of Jupiter's atmospheric disturbance and the phi-bound temporal pattern of disturbance for the Sun's electromagnetic field. The best way to understand this pattern is to glance over first the evidence for its existence and then explain its cause. The evidence consists of the 11-year sunspot cycle during which the occurrence of solar flares and prominences alternately increases and decreases. The model that has best thus far accounted for this process is the winding up of the Sun's electromagnetic field currents due to the differential rotation of the hot gas of its body at different latitudes. This occurs for 11 years, causing outbursts where the currents overlap until finally these number so many that they short circuit the entire ball of string and it returns overall to a base state, at which point the process can begin again. Because the timing of the cycle does not increase exponentially, it is clearly pi bound in total. However, the occurrence of solar activity during the 11 years does increase with time, and therefore the rate of flares, prominences, and sunspots is phi bound. It is demonstrable that it is at the peaks and troughs of the temporal sine wave that the phi, or algorithmic spiral, takes root. 
It can also be stated with a degree of certainty that it is at the juncture points of this algorithmic spiral that the solar supersaturation event transpires and the entire electromagnetic field resets itself. Lastly, it may be noted that the practice of using histories for particles is utilized astronomically in the theory of quantum gravity to study a similar supersaturation in the very young universe where phi bound bubbles are thought to have formed within the pi bound symmetry of the early universe as the third dimensional factorial phase shift occurred. In biology phi over pi occurs as the emphasized function in two areas pertaining to the reproductive process of cells. The first is in the determination of time intervals in the cell cycle or lifespan of a cell. The second is in the actual physical composition of DNA as well as the interaction of that structure with RNA in protein production. The cell cycle is divided into four spans G1 first growth, S synthesis, G2 second growth, and M mitosis phases. During the first growth stage, a trigger protein accumulates to determine if the cell will engage in replication. Some cells, such as nerve, muscle, and red blood cells in animals, and roots, stems, leaves, and flowers in plants, never leave this phase. During the synthesis phase, polymerases separate the helix of a DNA strand by breaking their hydrogen bonds. Two new complete strands are then completed as these polymerases attach corresponding nucleotides with complementary nitrogen bases. These will be discussed presently. Replication occurs at several places along the DNA strand at once, its helix being opened up like a zipper into replication forks where the opposite directionally oriented copying of DNA occurs simultaneously. The leading strand continuously adds nucleotides in one direction, while the lagging strand synthesizes short, discontinuous segments that are joined together by other enzymes which also serve as proofreaders. In the final DNA strand there is one in 10 to the fifth to a billion 10 to the ninth errors or mutation factor. Mutations that do occur are corrected by nucleotide complementary enzymes and sealed back together with DNA ligase. Within minutes of its synthesis, new DNA wraps around nuclear proteins called histones. Eight molecules of histone, two each of four types, make a nucleosome core around which the DNA loops twice. Nucleosomes are linked by DNA bound to a fifth type of histone, and all of this together makes up chromatin fibers. If there are three parts of chromosomes, called chromatids, in a nucleus, the cell is diploid. If there are only two, it is haploid. During the second growth phase of two to five hours only, minimal RNA protein and macromolecule production occurs. When the cell enters its final reproductive stage, the mitosis phase, chromatids are collected and held together at a centromere. There are four spans of mitosis. The first is prophase, during which chromosomes condense and the nuclear envelope begins to disappear. Microtubules form two diamond-shaped spindles and attach fibers from them to the centromeres. Next is metaphase, where the chromatids are pulled into a planar arrangement across the cell center perpendicular to the spindles. Then anaphase occurs. The centromeres divide and chromatids separate into chromosomes. The final phase is telophase, 
The chromosomes gather at opposite ends of the cell, and a new nuclear envelope forms between them. In animal cells, this is the plasma membrane. In plants, the cell wall. We should also consider the similar process of meiosis, or the replication of genetic material in the combination of cells from parental sources as occurs in the reproductive function. It is essentially the same as mitosis, but because the cells start out with three pairs of chromatids, they must undergo division twice before their full amount of genetic potential has been haploid integrated. Thus, they have twice the phases of mitosis, but undergo the same process. The only significant difference occurs in the very first phase, prophase 1. During this phase, each chromatid in a homogeneous pair, of which there are six total, exchanges parts of its replicated chromosomes for their identically paired counterparts with their paired chromatids. The new chromosomes are a genetic recombination. This is called crossing over. The time interval of the first and second growth phases in the cell cycle is clearly determined by a sine wave, as will be demonstrated shortly. In these cases, it is the amount of labor and not the length of time which is exponential. Thus, they may be plotted as points where the wave curves into the lower x values in our three-dimensional coordinate system. The spans of the cycle allotted for the replication and reproduction functions, however, are temporarily fixed by phi. They sweep upwards into the greater integer values and remain there longer. Now let us consider phi as it relates to the structure of DNA itself and to rate of processing in the relationship of DNA and RNA in building proteins. The backbone of DNA is a congregation of deoxyribose, sugar, phosphates. This forms the exterior pillars of the strand. Between these, like steps on a ladder, are four types of nitrogen bases that fall under two classification categories, united by a hydrogen bond. The classes of these bases are the single hexagonal ringed pyramidines and the double one hexagonal one pentagonal ringed purines. Thymine and cytosine are the bases belonging to the former class. Idonine and guanine are those belonging to the latter. One purine always binds with one pyrimidine, thymine to adenine, cytosine to guanine, according to complexity of structure. The formation of the helix itself is not exactly phi, but more closely resembles the complementarity of the sine and cosine waves. The axis does not penetrate the center at the hydrogen bonds, but is rotated about by the sugar phosphate backbone. This is due to the heterogeneous pairing of the nitrogen bases. If the same effect were produced binarily, the image of the medical cow disease would be exactly evoked. Phi itself only comes into play when the strands are separated, at which point it serves as the angle governing their divergence much as in quantum mechanics. It is also according to a phi determined number of rotations that the replication routine will begin and end. This is best examined in the RNA process. There are three types of RNA with purposes implied by their titles mRNA messenger, tRNA transfer, and rRNA ribosomal. These are involved in the three consecutive phases of protein production from the coating of nitrogen bases along the DNA double helix. mRNA polymerase produces exons, copies of regions of DNA 
They're expressed as polypeptide chains, or meaningful instructions, and throws away introns, replicated non-coding DNA. tRNA is comprised of codons, promoters, and anticodons, terminators, that begin and end this copying. Through tRNA charging, L-shaped, triple-looped rRNA binds to ribosomal subunits to create proteins from DNA coding sequences. Certain codon genes, called transposons, jump around to cause mutation. These alleles are alternative forms of a gene that have slightly different base sequences as a result of mutation and cause the genetic variation on which natural selection acts. The simultaneous existence of tRNA and the ribosomal subunits that act as factories for protein production begs the question of the chicken and the egg, but a solution is readily available in the primacy of DNA and analysis of its mathematical implications for congruent progression. All of these purposes occur during the first and second growth phase in the cell cycle. The replication process undergone by tRNA is somewhat different from that in mitosis, as it only represents the replication of abbreviated segments of the DNA which are specifically designed to promote protein generation. As such, it breaks with the time interval coding of these phases extrapolating a pi sine wave predicted amount of material and integrating it into a phi regenerative system in a pi factored span of time. It is at the beginnings and ends of these coding sections that mutation is most likely to occur. These examples from some fields of hard science can be called by one group term spontaneous symmetry breaking. In each of them, the occurrence of a given and predictable number in the progression represents a point at which change occurs, where the existing pattern is broken and a new, similar pattern is established, just as throughout the factorially identifiable sums of the products in Table 9. In short, with each dimensional gap it crosses, our bridge changes form. The spiral itself particularly the unique multidimensional nautilus-like spiral described by the ninth table factorial breaks is only one form of fourth dimensional shape. The platonic solids all have their correspondences in the fourth dimension as hypershapes of nested like within like forms. As we have already seen however the number of definite coordinates increases for each additional level of dimension, and so there are many more basic polygons that can occur in the fourth dimension than in the third. The number of these, as well probably as the structure, is a factor of the interval proportion of the underlying pattern, that is, the phi spiral. In closing, it is perhaps best to clear up why the spiral bound by pi whose value is 3.14159, is actually less than the spiral bound by phi, the value of which is 1.61803, despite the balance of their values being tipped more in the former's favor. It is best for this exploration to perceive the spiral in organic terms. The singularity is alike the seed, from which the structure springs. The second dimension is the roots, and the third dimension the trunk, offering stability and durability. They are both bound by pi in this respect, the greater quotient providing fuller form. The fourth dimension presents the shape of the fractal branching patterns that yields sticks and stems and finally leaves down to the veins, the leaves themselves are as myriad as the solids of the fourth dimension and arise, thrive, deteriorate, and drop away as living intervals of time. And these are bound by phi, the more delicate and diverse function. 
Now we may consider theories that substantiate this model. All structures that thrive in nature do so by establishing a firm foundation. The phi over pi spiral shows us this has been accomplished by diversification. The circular binding becomes spherical and subsequently omnidirectional. Not only are the later forms built from those of earlier dimension, each greater dimension is itself a bigger picture of the same hologram. Pi represents the base of the pyramid, which, although in our case more compact in terms of interval, is the keystone of the arch. It manifests this best in the singularity seed, the alpha and omega point. The latter lattices of the fourth dimension are merely elaborations upon this element. There are two types of complexity at work in our construct. That of pi is digital. Geometrically, the form it expresses is simple and precise. That of phi, however, is irrational. Its structure is elegant unto divine, and yet only rendered with expertise. One can infer a great many things from complexity of structure. As I have already stated, the closed and open states described by these shapes are inherent within their expression and yet of so pronounced a magnitude is this difference that herein lies their entire relationship. They define the very boundary of internal and external. The best explanation for the dynamic interaction of pi and phi is the simplest. At each point along their perspective arcs, it is their digital value that defines the degree of correction for their progress to the next point. Thus, pi is circularly closed because each point is connected to the last by an angle, such that all of these angles combined totals a full rotation around a certain number of points. So, phi is spirally open because its points follow the same relationship with a different digital code, such that a complete rotation is only accomplished after a greater number of points than that already established as comprising a circle. Finally, let it be said that it is not at precisely the third juncture that the pi spiral is transformed into the phi spiral, because this does not occur directly at a clean factorial break. The closest factorial break listed in the table of nines is multiplicative 117, but the true break occurs between multiplicative 112 product 1008 and multiplicative 113 product 1017. It is only at this break that the numbers again begin their repetitive climbing through subset integer sums between clean factorial sets as already evidenced in the second dimensional set. Thus it is not exactly at the gap between the single and double digit sum sets that the dimensional leap occurs, but rather a little after. It is, in fact, exactly 14% between the first complete repetition of factorial cycle in the second dimension quantities and the first transition in the second subset of factorial breaks in the third dimension that the leap occurs. In other words, between 99 the fractal redoubling of the line, and 198, just after the formation of the holographic triangle, both the work of the interaction of time. The phi over pi transition occurs at dimension 3.14. It is likely that a parity to this computation is evidenced in the termination of the multiplicative set of table 8, where it transits to the beginning of table 9. As the eighth table is necessarily infinite, its conclusion must be transfinite. Thus, its transdimensional crossing must supersede singularity by a slight though incalculable degree. As neither of these gaps technically exist, I will hitherto refer to them as positive zero and negative zero.